greetings and salutations. Uh, welcome to the very first down the middle that is going to be a little bit less economics, a little bit less finance, and a little bit more life, a little bit more philosophy, a little bit more philanthropy, a little bit more what we've taken away as life's lessons when we have great mentors enter our lives. With that, I would like to introduce you to none other than David Kotak, Chairman and Chief Investment Officer of Cumberland Advisors. David, thank you so much for being with me today. Always a pleasure to be with you. And I'm delighted that your haberdasher and my haberdasher were able to coordinate. Isn't it wonderful? Imagine they didn't, and they didn't even tell us. They did remarkable. And I wore the hair on top of the head and you wore the beard. So this is good. There you go. It was it, uh, serendipitous all the way around. <laughs> um, so today we're going to talk about, about fishing. We're going to talk about the genesis of an event that has become a meaningful aspect of so many people's lives, uh, so many of my dear friends. Uh, but why don't you take us all the way back in time to what first interested you in fishing itself? Oh my gosh. You're asking me to go back over 70 years. I am. Yes, well, I caught my first fish when I was probably four or five. And I went fishing with my father who taught me a little bit about it. And um, it was so much fun. I've been doing it ever since. So that's how it all started as a little boy fishing with his father. And in the interest of time, maybe you can go over the high points in terms of where you have fished in this world. <laughs> oh my. Well, I, I've spent a lot of time in some very exotic and wonderful places. Uh, I think I have 17 or 18 trips to Patagonia, some number like that, close to 20. I don't think it's actually 20, something like that. So Argentina and Chile are exciting places. Um, certainly all over uh, North America. And I guess the most exciting single fishing day was fishing and catching, actually, because they're two separate things, you know. People like to think they're catching when they go fishing. It isn't so. One has little to do with the other. And the more fishing you do, the more catching is less and less important. But I did take one trip to the Zambezi River and do a very exotic safari. I had to carry 240 pounds of gear for one day. It was like the famous fishing shows that you see where they carry all the stuff and they go all the sort of stuff. And I was able to do that once and actually catch a tiger fish on the Zambezi River. And that was a very exciting and very expensive fish. <laughs> um, at some point though, actually take, take me back since we're way back in time, take me back to how Cumberland Advisors came about, when it came about, where it came about. Oh my gosh. 48 years ago, it was founded. I had a partner, he's no longer with us. Uh, I was solo before that, I, this was 1973. I got out of the army, 1969. Uh, those are dates that wouldn't be in your uh, current memory. Uh, you, were, you may have read about them. And uh, uh, we formed Cumberland Advisors. He was in New York at the time uh, with Hutton. He was managing an office in Manhattan. He didn't like the direction of the industry. And the two of us decided we would launch a firm with no conflicts of interest, sell no product, render advice fee for service only, take no custody, uh, try to be a pure advisor. Now this is a while ago. And in those days, there wasn't much of that. And we didn't like the motivation of people to sell product for commission and render that sale in the context 
of independent advice. I'll give you an example. The life insurance salesman calls you on the phone and says, Danielle, you don't need life insurance. It's not necessary for you or your family. I recommend you do not buy it. And therefore, I don't want you to buy life insurance from me. How many such telephone calls have you ever received? Zero. Exactly. So what we wanted to do was take independent fee-for-service in its purest sense and fully transparent structure. And that's how we formed Cumberland Advisors in 1973. Remarkable history, David. Um, so take us forward. At some point, you came to a place called Grand Lake Stream, Maine. What year was that? And 30, how many were yeah. there? Well, I know you're going to ask me that question. When was the first time? So I went up with my son 33 years ago, the two of us and a guy. We stayed at a place called Weatherby's. We'd never been there. Uh, Weatherby's is still there. Uh, the original owners sold it and they're not there. Nice folks. There was a transitional uh, event, which is why we're not at Weatherby's now. We moved around and we've been at Lean's Lodge for a long time, as you know. Um, and we went to a remote place so we could bond a little, fish a little, and be father son. That was 33 years ago. My son is 46 now, uh, an excellent fly fisherman, likes to stand next to me on a dock and make sure that he throws 20 feet longer than I do in a straight line. <laughs> Uh, but that's the way it is. I look at him and I smile and I say, next week, try 30. I hope you get it. So that's how we do. That was the first trip. That was not Camp Coat That was going out in the woods to a remote place and fishing. And that happened a few more times with one or two others. And then it became three or four or five people, depending on which year. And think of it as, hey, a couple of guys on a fishing trip going out in the woods in Maine. And the evolution of who was included or who came or who wanted to go gravitated to economics, financial markets, geopolitics, serious thought. Let's not just go out in the woods and drink and eat and fish and tell jokes. Let's have some deep conversation in ways in which we can explore an idea. Along came 9-11. And as you well know, that changed everything. Why? Because people that you and I know, and I'll give you an example, Harvey Rosenblum. You know Harvey. Harvey was a mentor for you, may still be. Yes. Harvey introduced us more years ago than I think any of the three of us, including Harvey, you and me, want to count. So what did Harvey do? After saying no to me for a few years, he and I survived 9-11. We were at the same meeting in New York. And he said, you know something? I want to go with you next year. Another guy. Stu Hoffman, you know Stu, Stu. same thing. So Camp Kotak really started after 9-11 when it got bigger because of people who said yes instead of no. And of course, what happened is they found a place, as you now know from your own experiences, where you can in depth have conversation, not agreement necessarily. We, you and I have witnessed all kinds of disagreements up there, but you can have them civilly and you make friends with folks and you, in, you, you enlarge your network of informational exchange and thinking. And I have found in, in the last quarter century of doing this, so from 9-11, that's 20 years, 
and the few times before 9-11 when it wasn't just me and one other person going fishing. I always have a takeaway of something new. And if you go somewhere, anywhere, any kind of meeting, conference, gathering, anywhere, and you take one little speck away that's a new thought, it's worth it. I had that conversation with you the first time we met at a Richmond Fed meeting, I think it was. I think it was a Richmond Fed meeting. It was meeting. a Richmond Fed meeting. It was indeed. Yeah. So that's how it's evolved. And of course, then the name Camp Kotak, I didn't originate the name. That, that's another matter. I was up there. CNBC, at the time I was a contributor for CNBC, so I had a contract with them. CNBC was covering it. Steve Leisman came and he's interviewing me on the dock. And Becky Quick puts, or the producer that was doing the show, puts Camp Kotak in the uh, banner underneath the image. And Becky Quick says, Camp Kotak, that's a good name for it. So we really owe Becky Quick the thank you for the name. <laughs> so, uh, so as the bird flies is one matter. Uh, as somebody who lives in Dallas, Texas, uh, it's waking at oh dark 30, flying from DFW into Philadelphia, flying from Philadelphia into Bangor, Maine, and driving three hours northeast to the Canadian border and stopping for the best lobster roll in the world on the way. Um, how on it's a good thing it's a good thing you like the lobster roll. Oh I do. I mean well so and explain a little bit about what Camp Kotak is for the uninitiated. Oh oh and what I, I must go back David I was one of the inaugural eight women. What was that like? Uh, Why were let me do that one. Yeah let me do let me do women first. Okay. It was impossible to get a woman, women to come. What? Go out in the woods? What? Mosquitoes? What? You know, I asked and invited and invited and invited and got turned down and turned down nicely. And there was a whole debate about this because there was this whole circulating image that this is boys only like the club that used to be in California, the political group and all that stuff. I said, no, it's not. We can't get women to come here. They won't come. My friends in financial markets and economics, they won't come for one reason or another. Always say thank you, maybe next year, and always have some event, some reason, but say no. I invited Diane Swank a dozen times. Each time she thanked me, but didn't come. Ellen Hughes Cromwell didn't come. I invited her this year. I said, I know your answer before I ask you. She didn't come. But finally, we, we broke through that. And now that's not an issue, nobody cares. So that, that was the history. It was, I, I'm glad that it changed, but that's me. I don't need a boys club in the woods. And frankly, that would be boring. So this is a much better structure. So in answer to the women evolution, that's how it happened. Well, and what was the other? It helps to have a great roommate though, so. Of course it does. Well, I know who your roommate was. The two of you became fast friends at once and still are. We're, we're roommates again this year, I can guarantee you. I understand. I've been warned, warned. So for the uninitiated, after they finally make their way there, if you were a guide, if you were the, the president of Camp Kotok, oh wait, you are. But if you were to if you were to ask somebody how to prepare for solid days of fishing, and by the way, don't come if you don't want to fish. <laughs> you you learn that very quickly. 
but how would you tell somebody to prepare for, for three days of, of fishing in Grand Lake Stream, Maine? What, what should they pack? Well, okay, what should you pack? Well, first of all, this is very casual. So this is jeans, this is outdoors, this is, a, think of it as a camp for adults. You have hot water and clean sheets. You know, the, the accommodations are rustic, but pleasant, much good food, we all gain weight. But that's, so it's not, you're not living in a pup tent, as, as you well know. You, I would disagree with you on one thing. Fishing and fishing skills are irrelevant. And as you know, the guide will teach you what to do. I don't catch the fish for you. you Absolutely. Want. No, no. I, 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 will, I will never. I had been deep sea fishing before I came to Maine. And you are, I, I'm in complete agreement with you, David. You don't need to know how to fish. It's not that. It's the experience of fishing. There was, I'll, I'll never forget an afternoon, I sat in a canoe with Jim Bianco and we debated for three hours why Stanley Fisher would be coming out of retirement to become vice chair of the Federal Reserve while we fished and caught a lot of fish and had, a. I mean, it's one of those, one of the best memories of my life, but I still don't know everything that I needed to pack because boy, do I, pack, it, I, I check more baggage when I'm coming to Maine than any other trip, even if I'm going to Europe for two weeks. Now see, I only bring a toothbrush and a pair of socks. That's cool. <laughs> what do you need? You need rain gear because sometimes you can get caught in the rain. That happens everywhere, but it happens there too. And you need a light jacket and you need a hat. We give you a hat with your name on it. Um, um, and you need a couple pairs of jeans or fishing pants. You do not need fishing gear. Guides provide it for you if you don't have it, if you have it and you're a serious fisherman. I mean, for me at Lean's Lodge, I keep six rods and an entire gear bag. I, I really, Danielle, do that for two reasons. Um, number one, depending on where I'm gonna fish and how I'm gonna fish, that becomes important. Number two, we lost a very good friend, as you know, Jack Rivkin. Jack was a serious fly fisherman. So when he came up, he didn't bring a gear bag. Well, I don't blame him. He said to me, do I need a gear bag? I said, no, you don't need a gear bag. I mean, who wants to carry a 40 pound gear bag and do all the flights and travel that you just described? It's a pain in the neck. Literally when you carry it and metaphorically elsewhere. So I had a rod and reel and I said, Jack, I've got an extra rod and reel. I can fix you up. So I stopped to be able to do that and do that every year with someone. So that's what I keep up there. But a person doesn't need to bring any equipment. They can if they want to, uh, and some do. And they need two pairs of jeans and a shirt or cover up. But if they want to change, and you're you're one of the ones who likes to change for dinner. Yep. I wear the same pair of shorts and I wear bedroom slippers from the cabin to the lodge and eat dinner, which is a wonderful gathering of we have guests and we have comments and you've participated in that, so you know. And uh, this coming year, we've got two weekends because we divided the group because of COVID, we're, but we're full. And we have terrific commentary, you know, and the, the program, if you will, is a discussion followed by all of us involved in an informal discussion. There's no PowerPoint, there are no slides, there's no screen. I remember when Rubini came one time and Noriel comes up and he says, what do I wear? I said, jeans. Well, that was okay. I said, this is a casual place, camp in Maine. Okay, so he comes up and he's got a memory stick. And he, he says, where do I put the memory stick? I said, you can put it on the end of your hook, but you won't catch anything. <laughs> I said, you, what are you doing with that? He says, well, I got some slides. I said, Noriel, I told you, 
there's no slides. This is not any one of the 30 people, 40, 50 people can give speeches and lectures and present slides. That's not what this is about. You didn't need to go through all the travel to come here for that purpose. And I, Chris Whalen was with me. We, we had briefed him and everything. Meanwhile, he, he got upset with me because he brought a memory stick and he had to take it home. But meanwhile, that happened to be. No, no, wait, wait. Uh, you're getting, save that. You know where I'm going. Save right, that, David, Go save that. Please save that. Um, it's your dime. Let's do it your way. Okay. Well, well we're going to come to that because it's a pretty <clears throat> momentous event that we have coming up to us. It's a 10 year anniversary type of event. But first, uh, let's just say that the people watching and listening today have no idea what a Chatham House rule is. Okay, so Chatham House, there are actually two rules that apply at Camp Kotak, the Jackson Hole rule and the Chatham House rule. So the Chatham House rule says something like this. Uh, you can articulate publicly in something you write or something you say to any forum you want, the takeaway of the group. But you cannot quote anyone without their permission. If they, and most of the people, as you know, say, yes, sure, I don't care, you can quote me, but that's their choice, not the one who is the journalist or writer or other person covering things. So the Chatham House rule is takeaway of the group is public, individual quotation and citation requires permission first. Essentially, that's what it is. I tell the you, Jackson okay. Hole rule is a little different. Okay. Well, the Jackson Hole rule, which emanates from the meeting in Jackson Hole, is if you walk by a table and two people are talking and you happen to hear something in that conversation that you weren't supposed to hear, the jury is directed to disregard the commentary. That's a Jackson Hole rule. Now, you know and I know, business deals get done up at Maine. Negotiations have happened, mergers have happened, launches of new uh, securities, uh, introductions of people of all types. And some of those conversations are susceptible to eavesdropping either unintentionally or in some cases, sadly, intentionally. If we find that out, that person never gets invited back. Mm -hmm. And as you know, there have been a couple of occasions where there have been people who have been asked not to return and in two cases to leave. So the, the, the trustworthiness of the gathering is very important. And I think my takeaway from having had 20 years of this and hundreds of people is that it's rarely violated. It is well-respected. It's certainly well-respected by the people you and I know who go. Well, I will say as, as a veteran uh, that it is an, it, it's an extraordinary environment because you speak more freely, you think more freely, your mind is more open than it otherwise otherwise would be because of the discrete nature of the gathering, which makes it all the more open, ironically. Yes. Uh, so it's hard to convey the mastery, uh, the nobility, the beauty of third, fourth generation guides. And, but, but talk about how Camp Kotak has affected this part of the country uh, that in many ways is more impoverished and more rural than other areas of the country that many people would be familiar with, especially the people visiting uh, once a year when they attend camp. Well, uh, Washington County, Maine is one of the poorest counties east of the Mississippi. And it, uh, its character because it was really 
dependent upon a paper mill logging operation which closed and it was a one industry regional area so when the paper mills and that business went the way of evolution hundreds and hundreds of incomes for the region dropped so it's a poor county and the fishing guides uh, are, are part of a community which have been active in, I would say fishing is only part of it, hunting, fishing, outdoors, Maine, Maine northern Maine image the moose activity. <laughs> That's exactly. So they are a culture. Um, my view, they are wonderful, caring, real people. They follow from a distance the events of the world. I think they like us because they like to listen to the conversations. Maybe inside they're laughing at us, but whatever the case may be, that's the structure. So we become friends with them, as you know. I think you fish with JR. Every year. You've done that for how many years? How many years have you fished with JR? Every single time I've been. Many. It's been more than 10 years. Okay. Yeah. I'm spoiled. My, my fishing guide is a full, you know, uh, uh, unfortunately, he just had a tragedy. We're trying to help him with a GoFundMe account. My fishing guide is Ray Saka Basin. Ray is a full uh, blood Passamaquoddy Indian. His line lineage in his tribe is a thousand years old. His ancestry goes back to the days of acacia back to the days of the what we would we call the french indian war but it was really french and british and the indians were used the tribes all four of them were used as pawns by both sides the passamaquoddies at one point fought on the british side at one point fought on the french side and both sides didn't care about the people who were fighting for them so the history is quite a remarkable piece of the region. Unfortunately, in American education these days, the history, that history of that region and Acacia and the, that evolution has sort of dropped out of the history books. So, but it's there and it's there in real terms when you tour it around and look at it. So, I, you know, it's a, it's a very neat kind of place. The other thing, that I would suggest for people who are listening or to this interview is that the Passamaquoddy Indian Reservation land, which is a very large tract. And by the way, it's an equally large tract on the Canadian side of the border. There's actually four pieces to Passamaquoddy region, two on the Canadian side, and two where we are. And where we fish is just one of the two. We, we don't go to the other one, it's 40 miles away. So you, you, you look at the history and you say, here's this large tract of tribal land. It doesn't change. It doesn't get a new hotel. It doesn't get developed. It has a set of rules and the tribe governs the rules. Adjacent to it, is another two or 300,000 acres of land trust, which was part of a, a master settlement of paper mill companies and logging and so forth. And as you know, when you stand on the deck of Lean's Lodge and look at a sunset, on your left is all this land trust. And in the back and on the right, is all this reservation land. And I have been standing on that deck for probably quarter century or close to it. Not one new house is built on that shoreline. The only buildings on the shoreline occupy the camp sites or house sites that preceded the land trust and the reservation land. 
You know, David. So it's um, pristine. Yep. And it's not going to change. So I ha I've stopped on a few of those uh, when when there wasn't time to get to to lunch, just to borrow an outhouse or two over the years. Uh, JR knows where all the cleanest ones are, and that's a good guide. <laughs> So uh, yes, let, let's talk about something important. So uh, let, let's just say I was to bring a case of two buck chuck from Trader Joe's. Would I ever get invited back? And by the way, while we're on the subject of wine, why don't you walk us through a rookie's lunch and experience and tell us uh, what the role the wives play. Just let, let's have lunch on, on Camp Kotak. Well, okay. I don't know about the particular vintage of two buck chuck. So <laughs> that's a, that one. I'm, it's not in my radar screen. But you know, we developed a tradition of fine wines, libations. Some people bring uh, other things. Uh, I remember Martin Barnes coming up and bringing some wonderful old seasoned, delicious, three drop at a time, uh, single malt scotch. Single malt scotch, the, the Scotsman, yes. Yes, and he put them on a table and he said, if you can name correctly, I'll let you have one. <laughs> and it was wonderful. So it's not just wine, but the tradition is wine. Uh, most people, uh, bring a case or ship a half a case per case. We share and we taste and compare. And we do that in a dinner for those who wish. So lunch can be an interesting affair. You think about this, you get up at six or 6.30 or so in the morning or 5.30 or six, depending on uh, whether you're an early riser. By the time we're in the dining hall at 6 30 in the morning there's half a dozen lap laptops that are busy i always think of Gar barry ritholtz i don't know he must get up at 4 a.m to get there before anybody else i don't know so it, there's a lot of activity breakfast we pair up we have fishing guides we organize ourselves the fishing guides and the cooking guides in the lodge have already started the process to greet us with a sumptuous outdoor shore lunch, which is cooked by them. And if we bring in fresh fish, they cook it on the spot. Once you do that, you won't eat frozen fish anymore. You learn that what fish are supposed to taste like. <laughs> and and uh, those lunches can go a couple hours. They're great discussions. We have guests. Um, we've had the Consul General of the region from Canada stop and say hello. At different times, we have different special guests. And they may visit at lunch, say a few words and greetings and mix and talk with people. Or we may do the same thing at dinner. As you know, we've had governors and senators and congressmen and yep. Uh, Federal Reserve officials and foreign officials and people from all over the world. So that, that's how the meals work. The lunches are all outdoors. There are different lunch sites every day. The gathering and fishing terrain is a different location every day. So it's diverse. It's not going back to the same pond three days in a row. Um, and that's the experience. I don't know of anyone who has ever said it's not fun. I do know two people who I will call them those who fish by going to Zabar's and buying some smoked salmon and call it fishing and they want to stay on Central Park because they want to walk in the park and that's their experience with the outdoors. <laughs> we had two like that. That's okay. You're allowed. And they said, I'm not coming back here because it's it's not a Ritz Carlton. And I said, well, that's a matter of choice, but I'm very happy you came once and enjoyed the experience. Or you can learn to pack everything you possibly need, which uh, we do learn how to do as the years go by. You can adapt Camp Kotak to your needs. I can tell you that there's an entire section of my closet 
that is dedicated to high heel wedges. I'm very vertically challenged. And I've learned that one of the first lessons I took away from Camp Kotak, not that any man needs this, is that you cannot wear high heels, but wedges will take you all the way through the night with the height most people think you are. That was, a, that was just an aside, David. Um, so uh, Nuri Rubini, I happened to uh, be on my first and last float plane ride in and out of, uh, out of Grand Lake Stream. I got a little nauseous. I did see a moose uh, and I sat right behind Rubini who happened to be uh, on a no carb and no alcohol diet at the time. Uh, Boy, his timing was poor. I would his timing was poor, but as far as Bloomberg was concerned, his, his presence there uh, was auspicious. Tell us about the Friday of August the 5th, 2011. The, the, the well, Bloomberg ten, satellite yeah, band ten, packed up and it was ready to go. Well, 10 years ago, um, Bloomberg had broadcast from the camp. They had finished for the day. Um, people in the afternoon, it was a Friday afternoon, people were uh, either taking naps or they were out fishing or out doing things or whatever. And somebody pulled a car in and parked in a way that wedged the TV truck. It was a live truck shut down, but it couldn't get out because it couldn't turn around to get out. So the guys that were stuck there because they, they we, we didn't know whose car it was, couldn't find somebody to move the car. They might've been out on a boat, who knows? And th there was, uh, they were stuck. In fact, there was a discussion. I said, you can stay for dinner, that's all. You know, you can't get out of here. You might as well enjoy yourself. Well, the US gets downgraded by Standard & Poor's. That was on a Friday after the close. Um, most of financial television and financial news had shut down for the weekend. Um, Mike McKee gets a call from New York. Where's that truck? It, we can't find it. We want it back. The U.S. has just been downgraded. And Bloomberg in New York thought the truck was about two hours drive away from the lodge. <laughs> And they, I don't know if you knew this. Oh no! I and was they were trying. To, no, so so they were trying to find the truck, which was shut off, parked right outside the lodge, and they were trying to find the truck to get them to turn around and come back because here you've got this cadre of people that you could interview, and we've just had this remarkable event. So one thing leads to another fast answer to the producer was the trucks outside, fire it up. And Bloomberg broadcast live from Camp Kotak for five hours that night. They went on into, I don't know, 10, 11 o'clock at night they did. before they shut it off. And I think they were the only ones live with uh, people in an interview. Rubini was one of them uh, and McKee, you know, had a whole gang, so he had a field day. It was, again, where there was no uh, conspiracy here, no plan, nothing. It happened by accident. Well, things like that happen in the woods in Maine. Accidents happen, and sometimes they're good ones. So, um, so back in Maine, uh, S and P back then, they, they were concerned that the U.S. had not addressed its entitlement spending, which was runaway, and the US had not properly addressed tax policy either. And those were the two main reasons for the downgrade. And at last check, uh, there will be yet another debt limit that's approaching as Camp Kotak is opening up for week one. Well, this is true. Um... I would say if you examine the history of the United States and we maybe start with Hamilton, I, I would dismiss the early history of the continental dollar, which was a hyperinflated currency and start anew with the constitutional period. You could say we've always had a debt limit and we've always had a debt problem. And we've never been out of debt 
although I think we came close with Hamilton, but not, uh, uh, not to zero. And probably we always will have. That's the nature of our system. As long as we borrow denominated in our own currency, which we do, and as long as the world permits us to maintain the world reserve currency status, which so far it has, then I don't see the debt limit as an issue, except the one time when Newt Gingrich was going to use it and try to trigger a default. And in that one day, there was a slippage of so many basis points, I don't remember exactly now, in treasury yields on the threat that Congress would intentionally act to, to trigger a default. That lasted hours, not even a full 24 hours. So I'm not so worried about the issue. It's ugly politics and it's a game and a charade. We all know it. And it's a shame we have to have it and have to put up with it. Well, I think that, uh, I think that in the decade that's passed, we have seen a lot of ugliness in, in politics. Um, we are a, a divided nation right now. And I would bring up the subject because it's so near and dear to you and the work that you've done since the beginning of, of 2020 uh, on not the emotion necessarily of the pandemic of COVID-19, but on how devastating it can be economically. And you've recently published a piece where the Italian in me would say, uh, you're, you're going to the mattresses. This is the first time I've seen this in a little while where you're going to a little, you're leaning a little, little bit more towards cash. And your reasoning, you can walk me through this, is that there are quite a few unknowns right now. And COVID's at the top of that list. Even though I think a lot of people would suggest to you that the country's moved on. Are they right? Well, uh, there are people in the country who are celebrating it's over. And every once in a while, one of them gets sick. Some of those who get sick get hospitalized. And some of those who are hospitalized die. To me, that's not over. So I'm not convinced. I would say three to five years from now, we might declare that the pandemic has morphed into an endemic health problem. Mm -hmm. And then it'll be with us for a long time, but it'll be endemic. So if we really think about the three phases, you have an epidemic. We started there in China. You become a pandemic. We're in it. And eventually, it becomes endemic. There still exists in the world, smallpox. There still exists in the world, measles. Right now, they are endemic. They weren't, but right now they are. Now what's happening, unfortunately, is that there's a larger and larger cohort of people who don't understand the risk of measles. So they're not taking precautions. And what do we see? Measles is growing again. And what do we see as an outcome? Sickness, poor health, some death. So that's a cycle. I, I wrote in the piece that was just published that we cannot change human behavior. Our behavior is awful. And we evidence it in our governance and in our system. It's very sad for me at this point in time to look at the political divide in the country, Danielle, to see how politics has overtaken communal concern for public health. When I was a kid, I didn't grow up that way. Nobody asked me at the Rotary Club picnic or at the hospital fair, or in, in, in civic activities, are you a Democrat or are you a Republican? Are you red or are you blue? It didn't matter. 
when I was in the army in the 60s, there were a whole lot of people that didn't want to be there. We had a draft. We had made elections and choices. You didn't ask the guy next to you, are you a Republican? Oh, you're, you're a socialist left wing liberal Democrat and you're wearing a uniform? You can't fight alongside me or vice versa. I got off a call uh, two hours ago with a man I'm doing a panel with at the Rocky Mountain Economic Summit next week in Teton Springs. And we are the COVID panel. We are the, the healthcare panel. And he's, he's got a biotech company. He's got a view. He, he looks at the, the structure of the virus and he says there was some intervention by science to make this more virulent. Natural viruses don't work this way. I have had others tell that to me. And that's the debate. We never will find out 100%, I think, unless some revelation comes out, that would be a big surprise. So one side, our side says Wuhan lab leak. You are experimenting with making these things more vicious and you succeeded and you had a leak. China side said, no, it wasn't us, it was you. It was at Fort Detrick in Maryland. And by the way, how do you deny it? Your own CDC shut down Fort Detrick for three months because of leaks and rigidity of rules not observed. Well, if you're an American, how do you say, you can't say that didn't happen. It did happen. So my view is the, the problem in public health has become this too much, too much doing this. It's your fault. No, it's your fault. And that got into our politics. And we lost our compass. The compass went spinning around. It couldn't find north or south. We were too busy doing this, too busy in the, in the fight of politics and governance and power and geopolitics. And we didn't pay attention to public health. And our agencies failed us. Read Michael Lewis's book. He's reporting things that we don't want to hear, but it's true. We don't want to say our CDC screwed up 15 million tests by doing something they never were equipped to do. The system in the United States has contractors with specifications manufacture things. What was the CDC doing? saying, we'll manufacture this. They don't know how to manufacture anything. Their science, studies, examination, accumulation of data. And the next thing, which should enrage America, we had 50 states doing 50 different things and we had governance in many of them that failed. I'm sad to say, I live in Florida. I still don't understand the decision except politics triumphed over public health. Public health lost, political power grab won, people died. That's the simple summation of COVID in the United States and sadly in other places in the world too. So this is very troubling and it isn't over said so david um you better bring you better bring a gallon of two buck chuck when you come up uh, i i bring much better wine than that and you know it um so <laughs> the beauty of camp kotak is that i couldn't tell you the political parties of most of the campers at present and i'm pleased to be able to say that you've created a unique and special place um what what are your life lessons? What are, what, what are your takeaways? What's the moral of the story of, of Camp Kotak that you would convey 
to everybody who's ever attended, to everybody who's never been able to attend, and to future attendees. Well, I think we, we have a quarter century or so of evidence that people of goodwill can behave civilly, can engage in debate and discourse, take differing points of view, and not be in fisticuffs with each other and have mutual respect. And do so, by the way, in the same way that we can have a, a gathering and we can have a good meal and we can have a little music and we can relax and we can find a pristine place that hasn't been spoiled to do it. And that's a nice thing. So my takeaway is um, having sort of evolved this thing over uh, many, many years, it's a nice thing. We're, uh, we're changing the legacy of it with the Global Interdependence Center, with which I know you're very familiar and a supporter. So the GIC is now going to do the organizing and uh, the, the administration. Um, Cumberland Advisors has agreed to that. Um, it was a recommendation that I made because I said to my colleagues at Cumberland, either one of you has to replace me and do this and replace Sharon Prezant, who is now retired, or we have to find another mechanism. And uh, none of them uh, volunteered, no hands went up. <laughs> so I, I said, okay, how's this? I can work this out with the Global Interdependence Center. Let's try it for a year and see if it works. And if the structure works, then Camp Kotak can continue, whether there's a Kotak or no Kotak, separate question. And the, the structure and discussion and the value of it to a lot of people can also be sustained. They agree, we're, we're, we support it, of course, and we're doing so this year. And, you know, I'm at a stage in life where things are uncertain. Will I be back a year from now when I'm 79? It would be nice, or 80. I'm not gonna tell you, we're gonna celebrate an, an 80th birthday this year up there, not mine. And we've got fishing guides, Danielle, who are 79 and 80. So we also have a couple of young ones, not enough. So I'm a believer that all successions and transitions happen. They happen one of two ways. It either happen because you have some succession plan, some structure, you lay out a map and you attempt to implement it. And hopefully you successfully. I'm doing that with Cumberland as I get older. I've got more and more key people, you know them, and they take greater and greater roles. And I become an old guy who's a troublemaker. That's the way it should be. So the alternative is not to do succession and transition planning. And then you have it anyway, but it's abrupt and sometimes chaotic and damaging and painful. So our election is the former. We're trying to do that. Jill Fernito and her staff have done a superb job, as you know, because you've dealt with them this year. I think they got it. They know what to do. The lodge has it. You know, I say to myself, I don't even need to go. Why should I go through all those troubles and all those flights and all the travel from Bangor to the main woods. I've seen it, why should I go? But then I'm gonna go. I decided I should come back. So I can see you. We should wear blue together one time. We'll coordinate one more time. I have one last, one last question for you since this is being recorded. Uh, yep. I've managed to avoid uh, anything that has anything to do with knives and eels for more than a decade now. Can I please get it verbally that I'll never ever have to touch an eel. I will uh, take this request under serious advisement, but <laughs> when it comes to the, it, the eel skinning committee, you know, it's, it's, 
we're, we don't have a dictatorship up there. As you well know, we have to engage in conversation. But you have managed to avoid it. So you have a good track record. I do indeed. I plan on keeping it. I can't wait to see you. I thank you so much for bringing Camp Co-Talk to the rest of the world. God bless. I will see you soon, David. I hope so. Stay safe and careful, and I'll see you in Maine. Take care. Bye-bye. Bye. There's no comparing uh, anybody I've ever interviewed on Down the Middle to David Kotak. Uh, he is he's an individual without, without a parallel. I hope you enjoyed his wisdom and his insights. And, uh, and if you're curious to see other people's views who have attended Cam Kotak, you, know, you, you, you can watch... Uh, you can watch David Rosenberg, or you can watch Peter Bookvar. You can watch John Musso. These are great examples of Camp Kotak veterans who you'd never know we come together in the woods because once we part ways, we all go off to our other day jobs. Uh, but, but thank you for spending a little bit of time uh, going inside of a very special place uh, for those who know it. And I look forward to the next time. Thank you so much. This is Danielle DiMartino Booth with Down the Middle.